In this video, I'll be answering your Steam Deck questions and responding to comments. My channel might not have enough subscribers to get responses from, but theirs do, so I'm breaking all the rules and I'm responding to their questions and comments. Thanks, Steve. Oh, and it looks like I eventually managed to get some myself, too. Neat. Will the Steam Deck overheat, throttle, or become uncomfortable to hold? Gamers Nexus tested this and found the Steam Deck has very robust cooling, so it's unlikely to throttle even in very hot climates. All the components that get hot are towards the middle of the unit where you won't touch it, so you don't need to worry about it becoming too hot to hold. Since battery life is already a point of concern for any portable device, I am a little worried about it getting so warm though. You ideally want to keep a battery cooler because a lot of heat causes them to degrade faster, especially while charging. How capable will the Steam Deck be of emulation? The Steam Deck will be able to emulate almost any system with a mature emulator. This includes many PlayStation 3 and even some Nintendo Switch games. Nintendo Switch is a special case because it actually has a handheld mode which reduces system requirements. In handheld mode, the Switch runs games at 720p or so, unless you're monolith and you understand that anime titties are best represented by as few pixels as possible. Any Wii or GameCube game should run fine. A lot of Wii U games should also be alright. Even Metroid Dread should be playable, but more complex games like Shin Megami Tensei V or the Switch version of Breath of the Wild will probably be much too heavy. Why not just buy an equivalent priced laptop so you can have a keyboard, more USB ports, more performance, and a bigger screen? Under normal market conditions, this might be reasonable, especially for the most expensive model of the Steam Deck. But even then, it would have to be on very steep discount to get equivalent or better performance. And that would be during ideal market conditions, not during COVID scalper hell. So buying a laptop of equivalent value to the Steam Deck is simply out of the question, even used. And that's still just talking about the 512GB model. If you factor in the 256 or 64GB models, it's not even a fair fight. But suppose you got lucky and you did find one. What would you get? Gaming laptops tend to be quite bulky, their battery life is very short, and they usually have terrible performance unless they're plugged in. Not to mention that you'd need a briefcase to carry one around with all the accessories you'd need to have roughly equivalent functionality to what comes built into a Steam Deck. So the answer, unfortunately, is no. You can't just buy a laptop. If it's any consolation, though, if the Steam Deck is a success, and by all indications it seems like it probably will be, there will be lots of competing devices to choose from. And while these might not be as good of a deal, they'll at least be in stock. What does Steam Deck Verified really mean? Does it mean those games will function identically to how they do in Windows? Ideally, yes, but probably not. Think about how many games you've played where things break and the developers can't replicate the bug. Or they break once, and you reload and it never happens again. These Steam Deck verifications aren't going to be like the exhaustive testing that developers put their games through. Someone at Valve, or maybe a contractor, is going to play a game for a bit and see if it seems to be behaving normally. They're not going to be experts in the games they're testing. They aren't going to notice subtle differences. They're very unlikely to play long enough for rare bugs to pop up. There will probably be some number of verified statuses getting revoked once decks start reaching customers and people run into bugs that they didn't encounter. On the other hand, the nature of the compatibility layer Valve's using could mean that some rare games actually work better than they do in Windows, especially on AMD graphics cards. Fan Advocacy Network says, Will this be a Switch killer? No, Nintendo's consoles sell on the power of first-party IPs and third-party support, not their hardware. I hope this does well, because competition is good. I agree the competition is good, but you're a bit off base with this one. Steam Deck literally cannot be a Switch killer, because regardless of how successful it is, Valve can't manufacture enough for it to be a Switch killer. Let's put things in perspective. The Switch OLED model sold almost a million units in three days, and Valve might optimistically sell half a million or so decks over the next six months. Regardless of how good it might turn out to be, the deck's not going to affect the Switch or Nintendo in any way. It's like saying that the Tesla Cybertruck is going to force Ford and GM to rethink their pickups. Eventually, maybe... But not while Tesla has a years-long backlog that forces anyone who needs a pickup truck today to just buy one of theirs instead, because you can actually buy one. The first version of DEC probably won't sell even as well as the failed PlayStation Vita, not in the current market. Pandemic stuff is starting to wind down, for now at least, but there's a backlog of hardware demand in virtually every industry that'll take a couple years to fully unclog. The deck's not even available to pre-order, you can only give Valve 5 bucks for a chance of maybe being asked if you want one in a year. I will say, since the Steam Deck was announced, I immediately began regretting having purchased a bunch of Switch games that I already owned on Steam, 
And there is now exactly zero possibility I will ever purchase a game on Switch in the future if it's also available on PC. Judging by Valve's highly conservative manufacturing choices in the past, it may not be generally available worldwide until maybe 2023 at the earliest, maybe 2024. However, if Valve is successful in bringing portable PC gaming mainstream, and they continue to develop that market niche alongside third parties with more manufacturing capacity, it's entirely possible that PC could become a much more dominant force in gaming. As far as SteamOS goes, it's not likely to get adopted by OEMs to save money either. Microsoft gives OEMs very cheap Windows licenses, like $10 per install or less, and if push comes to shove, they'd likely be willing to pay them just to not offer SteamOS. This is part of the reason Steam machines flopped so hard. OEMs would offer you two options. Do you want a version with a Steam controller and Linux for $500? Or do you want a version with the more expensive wireless Xbox controller and a licensed Windows installation? Or that same $500? How much storage will be available to install games on on the various Steam Deck hardware configurations? SteamOS 3.0 is based on Arch Linux. The Arch Linux wiki says a standard install uses 2GB or less. This is my relative inexperience with Linux talking, but I think that's probably for a bare-bones install without much in the way of desktop environments, but I could be wrong. SteamOS will use a desktop environment called KDE Plasma, which will take up to an additional 2GB if I'm understanding this correctly. Then on top of that, there's Valve's additional files for, well, Steam. On my PC, excluding my games, my Steam folder comes to 4GB. That brings us up to 8GB, but we should add a couple more for things like shader caches and temp files and all that bullshit. So, let's call it 10GB. Next, we need to think about the type of file system that's being used. Windows uses NTFS, which I know from experience means a 1TB drive will have 931GB of usable capacity. Linux mostly uses EXT4, which, please be patient, I'm trying my best, my math says should come out to about 934GB of usable space for a 1TB main operating system drive. But this is using default conservative settings, so you might technically be able to get more like 974GB. This gives us a factor of 0.934 to 0.974, depending on how EXT4 formatting is configured. After formatting and operating system installation, you'll want to maintain at least a certain amount of minimum free space for purposes such as virtual memory or temporary file storage for updating Steam, your games, and the operating system. 10 gigabytes or so is probably a reasonable buffer. Finally, SteamOS includes a new exclusive feature that allows you to instantly suspend games, and there's talk of possibly allowing you to do this with multiple games at a time. Depending on how Valve implements this, it might require free space on the SSD to dump the game's RAM allocation into, sort of like when you use a save state in an emulator. The Steam Deck has 16GB of RAM, of which Steam and SteamOS can be expected to occupy around 1GB at all times, so you might need up to 15 additional gigabytes of space kept free for suspending a game. Perhaps. Really depends on how they do this. With all the above in mind, the Steam Deck should have roughly the following amounts of usable free space for game installs out of the box. For the 64GB model, depending on formatting configuration, up to 49 to 52GB will be available to the user. If suspend states use SSD storage, that drops to around 34 to 37 gigabytes. As I mentioned earlier, at all times you'll probably want to leave a minimum of 10 gigabytes or so of free space. So in an absolute worst case, you may only have as little as 24 to 27 gigabytes of truly usable free space on a 64 gigabyte Steam Deck. 27 gigabytes minimum are required for a Windows 11 install, by the way, so dual booting should still be feasible even on the 64 gigabyte model if you install all your games to an SD card. Or the 256 gigabyte model. Depending on formatting, between 239 and 249 gigabytes will be free. If suspend to SSD is used, 224 to 234 gigabytes. And you'll want some free space for essential functions, so cut another 10 off, leaving you with 214 to 234 gigabytes of truly usable space. With a little luck, it'll be possible to dual boot Windows and still have at least 200 gigabytes of free space on this model. And for the 512 gigabyte model, depending on formatting, between 478 and 498 gigabytes will be free. If suspend to SSD is used, that drops to 463 to 483 gigabytes. Cut off another 10 or so to leave room for temporary file operations, leaving you with 453 to 473 gigabytes. Dual booting windows should leave you with around 426 to 446 gigabytes free. On the topic of patching games, 
Suppose you have 10 gigabytes free and a 20 gigabyte patch is needed. Depending on how the patch is structured and how the game stores its data, that might easily necessitate more like 50 gigabytes of free space to complete the patching process. Recently, I downloaded a 10 megabyte patch for a game which required over 15 gigabytes of free space to apply. Needing to keep such a big chunk of space free all the time would be really harsh, especially on a Steam Deck. But Steam recently added a solution to this problem. If you have a Steam library folder configured on a secondary storage device, such as an SD card, the patching process can be done entirely on the second storage device, and the resulting patched files will get copied back where they should go. The downside is this can take much longer to complete than patching in place. Is the internal SSD storage upgradable? This is a correction to a previous video. I said storage was probably soldered to the motherboard, based on what Valve was saying at the time, but it turns out that it isn't. However, there's two caveats. First, they're using an unusually compact type of NVMe SSD that's both more expensive and capacity limited than usual. A 2230 form factor instead of the more common 2280 form factor. This means that technically the price they're demanding for increased storage capacities isn't actually that far out of line after all. Second, they don't advise users upgrade their storage and Valve isn't normally the type to transparently rip people off. It turns out, they say the SSDs they're using were specially chosen to avoid risking any interference with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. This sounds like a bit of a crock to me, but who knows? Apparently not having shitty Bluetooth isn't as easy as everyone makes it look. Just ask Nintendo. The SSD is also a little tricky to access, and you might void your warranty in doing so. The deck's assembled with self-tapping screws, which means every time you take it apart, you're technically weakening it a little. You might reassemble it one time and find the screws just keep spinning. Whoops. So yes, it's technically possible to upgrade the built-in storage, but don't buy a Steam Deck with the expectation that you'll be able to. MicroSD expansion should fit most people's needs. Valve claims that microSD should be fast enough for most games. If microSD is fast enough, why didn't they cut costs by just using microSD for the main storage? Or have no storage at all and instead have a couple microSD card slots for users to provide their own? This would certainly cut costs, and I like the way you think. But the problem with microSD cards is that they tend to have a rather limited write cycle lifetime. They were envisioned primarily for write once, read many usage for bulk storage or intermittent writing like for digital cameras. They're not suitable for running an operating system, because an OS frequently writes a lot of temporary files. For games, they're perfectly fine though, especially under the modern paradigm where user content, like save data and so on, is almost always saved to the system drive instead of the location where the games are stored. Hydra Dude says, 16 by 10 aspect ratio. Ah, I see Gaben is a man of high culture as well. Mm. Indeed, Hydra Dude, 16 by 10 is a most patrician aspect ratio. I think it would be good to explain this though because a lot of people keep saying it's 720p when it's really 800p. The Steam Deck uses a 16 by 10 aspect ratio screen with a pixel resolution of 1280 horizontal by 800 vertical, or 16 pixels across for every 10 pixels tall, 16 by 10. Nintendo Switch uses the more common 16 by 9 aspect ratio of 1280 by 720 or 720p. 16 by 9 is so popular because it's a fair approximation of the average human visual radius. You can see much farther to the sides than you can see up and down, but it's not really ideal for PC use, especially at lower overall resolutions because it's so short that it's difficult to use for many standard computer interfaces, such as Windows 7 or Windows XP style dialog boxes. Before widescreen became semi-universal, the 4x3 aspect ratio of 1024 by 768 was the most common minimum screen resolution. As such, many old computer applications were designed expecting to have an absolute minimum of 768 vertical pixels to work with. But now we've got these widescreen monitors with just 720 vertical pixels to offer. Everyday stuff becomes very difficult this way. Think opening a dialog box in Windows and finding that the OK button's impossible to position on the screen so you can click it. Similar things also happen in old games. 768p, the official resolution of Ugly Bastards Everywhere, or 1366 by 768 emerged briefly but didn't really catch on except in budget laptops and some televisions. For a while, you'd find lots of 1280 by 800 screens, or as we describe them today, 800p. Usually, you can assume if anything ends in p, it's a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, and therefore you can make a safe assumption about the other dimension of the screen, but not this time, it's 16 by 10 instead of 16 by 9. You know, before we had to sell displays to idiots, you could just give them a clear, human-understandable name like WSXGA, and that was good enough. 
You'd go to the computer store, walk down to the library, check out the Encyclopedia of Science, figure out that WSXGA means 1680 by 1050, and then all was right in the world. Now you've got this P mess everywhere. 1920 by 1200 and 2560 by 1600 were other popular 16 by 10 resolutions, but like 1280 by 800, they've fallen out of favor and you don't see them very often anymore because it's cheaper for manufacturers to standardize on 16 by 9. Valve definitely made the right move going with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio for usability reasons, but it does mean some badly programmed games might end up stretching a 16 by 9 picture to 16 by 10 or else letterboxing the frame with black bars at the top and bottom. Most games shouldn't do this, but some will. How powerful is Steam Deck and how long will its hardware stay current? Steam Deck's hardware will be powerful enough to give an enjoyable experience on virtually any non-VR Steam game, within reason, for the next two to four years at least. Don't expect all or even most games to run with high settings though, and the most complex games will run best with a 30 FPS cap. As far as actual obsolescence, based on what we currently know about Steam Deck's hardware and the direction of future PC software and hardware trends, the deck's most immediate limiting factor might be hardware compatibility with direct storage. I spoke a little about this in a previous video I'll pop up a link to here if I can figure out how, and I'll talk more about this in a future video as well. In short, to use direct storage, the deck will require dedicated high-speed decompression hardware, and we don't yet know if this will be present. We know the deck's hardware is derived from technology similar to that found in Xbox Series consoles and PlayStation 5, which do have this hardware, but this doesn't tell us for sure that it will have it or not. If it does include hardware accelerated decompression, it'll also need correspondingly fast storage to make use of it. This means the base model 64GB deck will require users to upgrade their deck to support direct storage at all, and even the 256 and 512GB models may not be fast enough. Again, we don't know one way or the other for sure yet, but if Steam Deck isn't capable of using direct storage at all, this means some games are going to begin appearing which straight up can't run on it, even with Windows installed. Initially, most games that support direct storage won't make it mandatory though, since relatively few gaming PCs have the hardware to support it, and the silicon shortage, now predicted to last at least through 2022, prevents people from upgrading even if they wanted to. Most or all of these first generation direct storage enabled games will simply load much faster on a compatible PC, though there will probably be a small number that use it to great effect, though largely as a tech demo, a repeat of what happened with ray tracing for example. In the mid to long term, it'll become a growing problem though, since put to full use, direct storage will be an incredibly powerful game design tool. Developers will want to take full advantage of this on consoles, so it won't be possible to run these games properly, if at all, on PCs lacking direct storage support. With this in mind, if Steam Deck doesn't support direct storage, then by sometime in 2023 or 2024, it's a safe bet at least a small number of titles will have begun trickling out that either won't work on it at all, or will only work in a diminished capacity. If you buy a Steam Deck by the end of 2022, you might possibly only have a year or two where it'll remain truly cutting edge. Welcome to PC gaming. It's just speculation on my part, but this could be part of the reason why Valve is pushing it out now even though they have nowhere near enough manufacturing capacity to satisfy demand. The choice could be to put it out now or be forced to re-architect it around faster storage. Release it today and they can put out an upgraded version in better market conditions, maybe three years down the road. No matter how direct storage pans out, it won't be the end of the world. Check your list of most played Steam games and count how many of them really push hardware requirements. For me at least, the first truly demanding game is down in the 20s or so. Direct storage will probably be the same. The overwhelming majority of new games won't start requiring it for a long time. Look how many games still use DirectX 9 today. Is the Steam Deck compatible with Steam Workshop mods? Yes, Workshop mods should function without issue for the most part. Mods that require external installation, like dragging files into specific folders or running an installer, might be more complicated or even impossible, depending on the game. Keep in mind that mods which make their base game significantly more complicated to run might be too taxing on Steam Deck's hardware though. A Fistula Xanax asks, will it have Reseteer? Yes. Yes it will. Switch doesn't have Reseteer though, does it? Kind of a piece of shit when it's laid out in black and white like that, huh? Huh. Laker Gang says, AMD FSR is going to make Steam Deck a little beast. I could make a whole video about FSR. I don't think it's going to be of much use here, honestly. FSR stands for Fidelity FX Super Resolution, which is AMD's take on an image upscaling algorithm. 
It's a much less complex but also much less effective alternative to NVIDIA's DLSS or Deep Learning Supersampling. The two actually aren't very similar at all, but they do share the same goal. In my previous video, I said I wished Steam Deck had an NVIDIA GPU so it could benefit from DLSS, but upon further consideration, this wouldn't be as valuable as I thought at the time. FSR and DLSS work like this. You tell the game you want to play at 1080p, and the game actually renders the image below 1080p, say 900p or 720p, and then FSR or DLSS squints a little and tries to upscale the lower resolution image back up to the full size you asked for. When they work as intended, they provide a free performance boost with no obvious cost. In some situations, DLSS can squint really hard and actually make the resulting image look superior to how the original full-resolution, non-DLSS version would have looked. The Achilles heel of DLSS and FSR is that they need the image they are upscaling to have at least a minimum level of detail before they become truly effective. What I mean is, upscaling from 1800p to 2160p, meaning 4K, no problem, they'll both do a pretty good job and you'll get some free performance with little or no visual cost. How about from 1440p to 4K? DLSS will probably do a good job and FSR might start to fall apart a little, but they'll probably both be acceptable if you don't look too close. 1080p to 4K? Now you're starting to push your luck. DLSS might still look alright some of the time, but you'll start to see shimmer in places and FSR will probably look pretty rough if you're paying attention. All of these would still be acceptable though, considering their performance uplift. The problem starts when you go too low. Even if your upscaling target is fairly modest, like 540p to 1080p, or in Steam Deck's case, you might be trying to do 480p or 360p to 800p for example. When you're starting that low, the image begins its life as such an indistinct mess in a lot of places that the algorithm just doesn't have enough to work with. It'll frequently sharpen the wrong things, interpolate the wrong things, blend the wrong things, and for DLSS, literally imagine the wrong things. I'm definitely not saying there are no gains to be had from DLSS or FSR at the Steam Deck's native 800p resolution, but you'd want to avoid upscaling more than 10-20% to or so to avoid the image starting to look a bit rough. For the amount of extra GPU die space the AI hardware for DLSS would require, you'd probably be better off just adding extra shader cores to the chip instead. FSR doesn't require extra hardware, but also isn't quite as effective, especially starting from a low resolution. You might only be able to upscale 10% or so without any noticeable visual impact. That's not nothing, but it's not going to give a really noticeable performance boost either. Although FSR is much simpler than DLSS, it should still ideally be implemented by developers on a game-by-game -game basis. Technically, you can just tell FSR to upscale the whole screen without any input from developers, but the results of this will be less than ideal. What you should have is the game's interface rendered at native resolution and the game world, the part that's actually hard to render, rendered at a lower resolution. Applied to the entire screen, the game's interface might become difficult to read, and it might confuse parts of the game's interface, or even the mouse cursor potentially, as parts of the game world that needs to be blended together and sharpened. I've seen it, it's not ideal. Especially on a lower resolution screen like the Steam Decks, where reading the interface may already be a challenge. And unfortunately, despite how simple FSR is to implement, it's highly unlikely that developers are going to take the time to go back and add it to their older titles, which are the games most ideally suited to run on a low-powered handheld PC like the Steam Deck. What I'm saying isn't that FSR is bad, I'm saying that there's strong diminishing returns as your initial rendering resolution drops. FSR is ideally suited for VR, for example, because in VR games, you have to already start off at a very high render resolution, which gives FSR lots to work with. Charlie the Cockatoo, Cockatoo, Charlie the Cockatoo says, "All that separates them at the internal hardware level is the amount of storage." Quoting a Digital Foundry video, and the speed of storage—weird thing to miss, don't you think? This is in reference to what the Witcher of Digital Foundry said regarding the specs of all three Steam Deck models: that they are identical besides the size of internal storage. But intentionally or unintentionally, he's right to have omitted any mention of the speed of the storage because it probably doesn't matter. If anything, I fully expect that when Steam Decks start shipping, there will be plenty of people decrying the lack of performance difference between the various storage options and screeching about Valve being deceptive by claiming different storage options would be faster. The NVMe options are technically faster, it just won't actually matter much in practice. I made a whole video on this subject and I'll try to remember to make it pop up now. 
In short, the bottleneck for game loading times on the Steam Deck is going to be the CPU, not the storage, 99 times out of 100. Is there a docked mode? And questions derivative thereof? The Steam Deck does not have a docked or undocked power mode. It always runs at the same performance level. The Steam Deck is a PC though, so it's theoretically possible that it could be overclocked somehow, but that just doesn't have anything to do with whether it's plugged in or not. The Steam Deck's hardware is already running quite close to what it's theoretically capable of, so I wouldn't expect very much in the way of overclocking down the road. The dock that Valve's planning to sell someday is just an easy way to plug the deck into a set of peripherals like a keyboard, mouse, monitor, external hard drive, and so on. That's all it's intended for. Anthony Steele says, When you consider the price of a mid-range gaming laptop, this is decent. It sure is, Anthony. It sure is. Laptops have to be general purpose rather than focused exclusively on gaming, so they need to include many components that needlessly raise costs if you just want to play games on one. The laptop itself also composes the entire transaction, minus bloatware deals and warranty scams, while Valve can sell the Steam Deck for a low price and plan to make back some of their profit on software sales. But if most or all Steam Deck buyers already play primarily on Steam, how does Steam Deck create new revenue for Valve? By allowing you to play games at times and places you otherwise couldn't. If more of your schedule is open to gaming on Steam, you'll finish games faster and be ready to buy new ones sooner. I also have no doubt Valve's seeing a drop in game sales that's attributable to people who value portability buying certain less demanding games on Switch instead of PC. Without looking, I've probably bought at least 20 or so games on Switch that I would have much rather bought on Steam, but I wanted to be able to take them with me. Am I alone in this? Let me know in the comments. Is there anything important that the Steam Deck is missing? To add any new features would raise costs, and they're probably just barely breaking even on the 64GB model as is. If there was one feature I'd add though, variable refresh rate on the screen would be fantastic, even if it was only something like 40 to 60 Hz to keep the cost under control. Will the battery be replaceable? With great effort, it will technically be possible to replace the battery, but it's buried deep inside underneath everything else and apparently also glued in place and guarded by a leopard infected with that hot new AIDS. That's a no. Unfortunately, this is standard for consumer electronics nowadays, but you might be able to mail it away to have it replaced or... No. No, you cannot replace the battery. Will Steam Deck be compatible with Windows 11? Valve, AMD, and Microsoft are apparently all working together to ensure that Steam Deck will work with Windows 11, if not on day one, soon after. It's never a good idea to upgrade to a new version of Windows right away anyway. It always ends in tears. Steam Deck uses a Zen 2 based CPU cluster instead of the newer Zen 3. Does that mean Steam Deck's CPU is last generation? Yes and no. A significant part of Zen 3's performance increase comes from these chips' gigantic cache, similar to the design strategy AMD employs for their RDNA 2 graphics chips. They always omit most of a chip's cache in their mobile chips though, and instead use that die space for an integrated GPU. Since much of the Zen 3 performance benefit comes from this cache, but neither Zen 2 nor Zen 3 mobile chips have that cache anyway, in practice there's not necessarily the same giant leap in performance between generations that you might expect based on looking at the equivalent AMD desktop CPUs. I'd like to explain this better, but I would have to whip out so many names and acronyms that it would just... AMD isn't as bad as monitor manufacturers, but they have not made it easy to talk about their hardware. The short answer is, don't get CPU generation envy, you're good. These technically aren't quite cutting edge anymore, but they're very close. Morgan Kokik says, I really hope the Steam Deck does well. Maybe Nintendo will stop charging full price for five-year-old games running at 30 FPS if there's some competition. That's an exaggeration and you know it, Morgan. If you ignore that the original game included a soundtrack and upgraded Wiimote, they're charging a whole $10 less for Skyward Sword on Switch compared to Wii. That's a $1 discount per year. At that rate, your grandchildren will get Nintendo games for free and they'll go bankrupt. Apologize to Nintendo. I can wait. I've got all day. Morgan? That's better. Wilson Ramos says, I mean, press the price it clearly for UK customers. They ain't ripping us off like stormy apple and say dollars equals pounds. Well, Oh, wow. It must be day of the week. I found a person who doesn't know taxes aren't included in the advertised price of goods for sale in the United States and Canada. This is because taxes vary depending on the buyer and seller's location, 
and in some cases, the way they were born. Different states and provinces and territories have different taxes, and Native American and or First Nations individuals are exempt from certain taxes. As such, to avoid confusion, we leave it up to the person seeing the price tag to understand that the full price, including tax, will be higher than the sticker price. While we're on the subject, things having dollar in their name, such as US dollar, Canadian dollar, and Australian dollar, aren't automatically worth the same amount by virtue of their name alone. The amount of purchasing power a currency commands varies depending on a wide variety of factors. For example, to spend this didgeridoo dollar, do I need to be in a country infested to hell and back with things designed to kill me? Or, to spend this dollar, do I need to live in an igloo and have a black-faced drama teacher who prefers the term people kind represent me internationally? Or, to spend this dollar, do I need to be in a country that could end all life on the planet if we don't all agree their currency is worth what they say it is? People who complain about something being $10 in one country and $20 in another country because dollar are the second lowest form of life on the planet. What will game compatibility be like? Valve says they expect that by the time the Steam Deck's out, their Proton compatibility layer, which allows Windows games to run on Linux, should allow near-perfect compatibility with non-VR Windows games on the Steam Deck's pre-installed SteamOS 3.0. But I don't think you should reserve a Steam Deck expecting to play any specific game on it, besides Reseteer, especially on day one. Valve is infamous for delays, and this stuff's really complicated. Better to be surprised than disappointed. There's going to be a lot of games that don't run well, if at all, on the Steam Deck due to compatibility issues. In time, these compatibility issues might be solved, but not on day one. A lot of multiplayer games especially are not going to work properly. Other games that might not work well include niche games, the ones that have like 50 user reviews or less. Or games that are hard to get running just on normal Windows today, let alone I, I mean, oh god, oh god, I said it. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, Compatibility layered Windows. Oh, people. You will always have the choice to install Windows on the Steam Deck, though, as it is a PC. Just a strangely shaped one. Installing Windows would give you perfect game compatibility and even let you run things like Photoshop on it if you want. Or Premiere if you're demented. But battery life will almost certainly be worse in Windows, and you'll miss out on whatever performance tweaks Valve has put into SteamOS specifically for the Steam Deck. Guiley6669 asks, Kingston, new A2 masks are... I'll paraphrase. Why does the Steam Deck only have a UHS Class 1 microSD card slot? This should limit it to around 100 megabytes a second in maximum bandwidth, and there are faster microSD cards available. I understand where you're coming from, and I had the same thought. If they're going to include a microSD slot, why not use the best one available? I can see two possible reasons. First, Valve surely did the same sorts of tests I did, and they might have found that a faster SD card doesn't actually benefit performance very much, if at all. Micro SD cards are primarily intended for bulk storage, not running software. As such, they're optimized for heavy sequential data traffic, not random non-sequential traffic. I don't have a UHS Class 2 micro SD card on hand to test with, but speculatively, let's say it reads sequential data much faster, like 350 megabytes a second or so, but still only manages low double digits for non-sequential reads. Based on my testing in that video you're replying to, and my own first-hand experiences beyond that video, the bulk of a true SSD's loading time improvements come from its much faster non-sequential reads. That being the case, the added cost of a faster microSD interface might not be worth the small benefit. I admit I'm out of my depth now, but I expect since UHS-2 slots are much less common, they're probably disproportionately expensive, and there could also be an increased licensing fee for such professional hardware. Just a guess. A second possible reason is an I.O. bottleneck in the Steam Deck's APU. Look at any low-powered laptop, and you'll notice it doesn't have very many ports. Part of this is dumbass Apple-chasing minimalism, but another part of it is that additional I.O. capabilities make the CPU larger, raising cost and power use. It's entirely possible that Steam Deck's I.O. is very minimal and it's already tapped out with just a single USB-C port and NVMe slot. Otherwise, I don't see why they couldn't have put a second USB-C port on the bottom of the deck for switch-like docking functionality, unless that's covered by a patent. But docking stations aren't a new thing. Anyway, they could still add additional chips on the motherboard to split the NVMe slot's dedicated I.O., but now you're further increasing cost. Again, I'm completely out of my depth here, but let's say the total bill of materials involved in upgrading the microSD slot is... $2. dollars 
if they also save $2 by not having the latest Wi-Fi chip and save a few to more dollars here and there on other non-essential nice-to-haves, that could easily add up to being able to use a better screen or upgrading some other component that will greatly benefit every user's experience all the time instead of just people playing certain games specifically off a microSD card. Also, now this is just speculation on my part, but having a UHS Class 1 slot might not necessarily mean that it can't read certain cards even faster than the spec allows. I don't know. We'll have to test. That's the end of Part 1. Part 2 will be coming very soon, so please subscribe if you'd like to see it.